Well, Barry, it is 3.30, so if you want to go ahead and get started, we will get this going. And for those of you that are just joining, we are recording this, so if you miss any part of it, it will be up on our website in about 24 hours so you can watch it. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's always great to uh, be able to participate in, in uh, something like this, kind of building a professional community and connecting people. Um, so my name is Barry Nerhus. I'm the president of Endemic Environmental Services, which is a, uh, an environmental services company that does consulting and habitat restoration, stormwater services, um, you know, a lot of the field environmental consulting uh, um, uh, tasks. And um, my background is actually uh, an ecologist. So I come, out of, I come out of ecology and biology, biological resources, and have learned stormwater as a secondary, um, I guess, uh, professional certification. So I'm a QSD, uh, CPESC, you know, certification, things like that. So learned how to actually start implementing the stormwater and water quality um, services in compliance with the 401 permit um, for in-water work and things like that um, later on. So the baseline of, of understanding wetland ecology and wildlife and stuff like that has, has been the, um, that's been the primary. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to actually go through um, the basis of wetlands and, you know, why are we doing all of this? Why do we, the Clean Water Act exists and for all these different resources here. So I'm going to go through that. Um, I just want to, I just reminded, don't want to, do not disturb on here. So what we're going to do first is go through the, uh, what are we, hold on, let me, uh, okay, I'll just, so here's what we're going to cover. Initially, I'm going to cover you know, just some basic um, understanding of wetlands um, in an ecological sense. Of course, there's a regulatory and legal sense as well. Just that basic regulatory sense. In water work and diversions, you know, methods of uh, diverting uh, different creeks and rivers. So since I'm a biologist um, and we've done biological services primarily um, uh, as, a, as a foundation, most of the work we do are with rivers and, and kind of the tougher stormwater projects that, um, you're working within water turbidity issues and things like that to protect, um, you know, natural resources there. And then thirdly, we're going to go over the water quality sampling, just different methods, um, you know, for in water work and and uh, and or diversions. You know, as you're building a bridge, um, we've, we've done a lot of work with uh, Caltrans projects and um, bridge replacements, um, you know, and, and dredging projects and things like that. So. Um, First, understanding the different rivers, what a, a lodic system is. So lodic systems are basically moving water, flowing water systems like river streams, creeks, sloughs, and canals. Um, so you have the Consumnus River up in the, uh, um, the Sacramento Valley and the Feather River, which feeds into uh, uh, kind of that system that goes into the, uh, the delta there. And these are typically uh, the big rivers that have you know, salmon migrations, steelhead trout migrations, things like that, um, that, that uh, are, are really important for biodiversity, conservation, fisheries, recreation, you know, all sorts of, of different values. And of course, all the tributaries to this as well have other natural resources like the yellow-legged frog, red-legged frog, western pond turtle. So understanding that, you know, it's not even just the main river, but all the different tributaries and, um, and, and uh, other uh, uh, receiving waters into these rivers are really important and host different things. Now, lentic systems, those are the, these are the non-flowing um, bodies of water. So, you know, lakes, reservoirs, ponds, marshes, bogs, these are things where the water actually isn't flowing. So for me, the way I remember lentic is like a lens, a lens doesn't really move, you know, and that's how I actually remember um, which one's which. Lodic is flowing, Atlantic is, is, is stagnant water, which is kind of important um, when, you're doing in, when you're doing water quality testing for turbidity. And if, if a, a project, their water is coming off site, if it's a lentic system, it's really not going to flow anywhere. So the turbidity can be a little bit, um, it could be just stagnant, not really moving. Okay, so wildlife usage, like I said, the steelhead trout, for those of you that don't know the ecology, that's effectively just a rainbow trout that is anadromous, just like salmon. So steelhead trout are 
salmonids. They're still a salmon uh, in the fam uh, salmon family, and they have different um, spawning um, um, seasons. So the steelhead trout, unlike the um, the like Chinook salmon, have the Chinook salmon. They, as we know, a lot of salmon on the Pacific coast they they go up to streams and rivers and they breed and spawn and die. Steelhead can go can go up and down, up and down, up and down several times without ever dying. And actually, they're even the steelhead trout can have um, generations where they're only living in a freshwater system and never go to the ocean. So they're very plastic. Um, but with the you know 91% of wetlands lost in uh, California, um, they're be becoming a sensitive species. Um, and of course, if they if these are in your your creeks and everything, it becomes a high risk um, water um, for a, a swip, for instance. So uh, one way to tell a uh, uh, steelhead is you, you have these white lips. That's a real determining factor there versus dark lips of a, of a salmon. And they are, are very strong swimmers. They can get 24 inches or larger. Um, and different, depending on the river or the system, the region of California, they have different um, listings. So some, some runs could be endangered, some could be not endangered, um, threatened, or just a sensitive species. And in some areas, they can just actually be fished and eaten still. So and in Southern California, they are an endangered species, you know, especially due to our drought conditions in the South. So in the Chinook salmon, this is uh, the other, uh, the other uh, Andromedus um, fish that has the dark lips. So that's the way you could tell the difference. They utilize the same, same rivers um, and streams, especially in Northern California, Central California. Uh, Chinook salmon haven't been seen in Southern California for about a hundred years. So we probably lost those runs a long time ago. And those are both predatory fish. That's why you can fly fish them and everything like that. So uh, amphibians kind of stay out of the way of, of those areas. But in um, little uh, tributary streams that contribute to these larger rivers, you do have amphibians living there, like the California red-legged frog. This frog is the largest uh, native frog that occurs in California. It is federally threatened species, uh, state species of special concern. So a lot of these, so, uh, <clears throat> and amphibians are, are very uh, sensitive to, uh, to uh, turbidity, water disturbance, things like that. You can't really detach, you don't want their eggs to, uh, Detach when they're to uh, emergent vegetation like cattails or or, um, or or bulrush things like that. So uh, when you're doing in-water work and during a certain time of year, you could actually dislodge those eggs, and then um, you, you've kind of ruined their their generation there. I don't understand why. Uh, there we go. The foothill yellow-legged frog. This has been uh, this is another one that's kind of in the upper cleaner. Um, clear waters away from these predatory fish, um, and they are uh, they're a state in endangered species um, in certain regions of the state, so not all populations. So be careful when you're reading your permits um, to take into account which you know where you're at in the state, because uh, I think um, in Northern California, like Lake County, North stuff like that, they're not listed, or Shasta County. There's different regions that they're not actually listed. Um, by the state of California, but in the valley, um, the Central Valley, they, they definitely are. So um, these use cobblestones, much cleaner water, as opposed to the red-legged frog that could be in a little bit uh, uh, more like ponds and marshes, lentic systems, and streams as well. Well, these are pretty much uh, just lodic system, high moving streams with very clear water for the most part. Then the western pond turtle, this is another species that everybody should be uh, aware of. This is a candidate to on the endangered species list right now. Um, it has two uh, subspecies, the southern, southwest and the northwestern pond turtle. So uh, they kind of split really at the uh, central, northern central valley to uh, San Francisco Bay area. And these have been declining also because of habitat loss. Um, so a lot of different sp sensitive species that occur in the area. You know, and those were, I'm kind of going up the food chain from fish to mammal here. And so then you also have, you know, sea otters and, and beavers, which are important. They're fur bearing mammals, so still regulated by uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So all this stuff is really important when you're doing work 
and working around water with these biological resources that do occur. Um, and of course we have, uh, it, uh, sorry, I went too fast here. You know, we have human usage. That's kind of the, you know, we have a kind of a, a, a inner, inner uh, play here with rivers where, you know, it's hot. We like, we like uh, float, doing river floats and, uh, and boating and fishing ourselves and utilizing it. Uh, we're a stakeholder in, in rivers and streams too. And to make sure that our work uh, keeps these waters clean for, for people, for, uh, for fishing, and this is kind of a connection with uh, with uh, nature. Definitely, uh, striped bass should be fished out as much as possible, since that's a non-native fish. So that's great that that little kid caught it. Just keep catching them, you know. Um, and of course, what's the most primary importance of all this is uh, drinking is drinking water for our society. So you know. Um, I would think that if we maintain, make sure that society maintains the biological resources and ecology within these systems and take care of it to protect that, we know that our water, if, it, if, those, if the ecology can survive and be stable, of course, our water will also be, be clean and less an indication of lower toxicity, which means lower treatment, lower energy, all that stuff. Of course, another huge, huge um, reason of humans need water is for agriculture. Uh, California, a huge producer of rice, which actually has created a lot of wetlands um, and actually a threatened snake, the giant garter snake, uses these wetlands um, for a lot of habitat in the Central Valley. So uh, use, use uh, millions and billions of gallons a year um, for agriculture. So this is a very old map of, uh, I alluded to uh, a loss of 90% 90, 90 or more of wetlands in, in uh, in California, and it's pretty much around the river systems have been dammed and diverted, um, graded, some of them were seasonal. And this map is old, who knows what the, uh, I don't really have an updated map, um, but uh, we know the Salton Sea down here, which is artificial, is shrinking, the river is barely, is having trouble flowing now with stronger droughts. So this is becoming even uh, uh, a more strained system with what's remaining, which is about 9% or less. So that the quality is still dropping. So of course, I probably haven't listed every act and regulatory agency for that. I apologize, but these are just examples of all the different regulations, you know, to protect these waters and who owns it and who's regulating it for what reasons based on what history. So Clean Water Act, you have different sections of it, the farm bill to make sure that we have food resources and they have access, you know, having clean um, rivers and harbors. All this stuff is, is so that uh, our natural resources can be managed, regulated and protected while also having, um, you know, society, you know, improving infrastructure, develop, you know, growing in, in numbers and, and all of that too. So it's kind of, all these agencies are trying to find that balance together. Here's an example of uh, something that I've done is, is about uh, 2009 started creating uh, wetlands um, to help filter water um, through, uh, through a system in Orange County here. So this is Fairview Park. Uh, this is just a dirt field. And we created uh, six acres of wetlands over this 40 acre parcel here for, uh, for mit different mitigation resources. We actually pumped the water up from um, what I like to call urban slobber, which is really what it is. is it's uh, just runoff you know, from car washes and ditches and, and uh, you know, urban runoff essentially. Um, and we uh, placed a pump in that channel before it reached um, the Santa Ana River, which then drains the ocean. This is roughly about two miles upstream from the shoreline and pump it into these ponds. And I designed um, bulrush, and, bulrush and cattails in certain areas of, of each pond to help filter that. And we did see definitely a decrease in nitrates and um, increase in dissolved oxygen. And we have several endangered species that utilize this area. And it actually is a little bit of a riparian forest. So at least right here, we did create six acres of wetlands to help out. This is what it looks like today with uh, lots of water flowing um, right there in Orange County. I don't know if anybody uh, is, is from that area, but Orange County is uh, quite the, uh, <clears throat> the spot that uh, is heavily urbanized compared to, to a lot of different areas of the state. So. Um, this is really filtering water quite well, and um, there are different ways, and that could be the future of, of uh, increasing our water 
um, our water resources. I actually believe personally, you know, humans, we've, we, we, you know, in society, we, we take and taken and taken and taken and recycling and all that's great, but that's not really putting it back in. Uh, in my opinion, I think we should be adding things back. You know, if you take and now the balance is off one way, you got to start putting it back in balance. So creating wetlands like that, um, not just for capacity, but in terms of ecology, will definitely um, improve, uh, uh, I think, our state and our, and our water resources and storage capacity in the natural aquifers. <clears throat> so the next stage, the next stage here in water work and diversion. Um, so um, the work that's needed to do, um, you know, is all based on what's written in, uh, for a project in the 401 permits, um, you know, and make sure when you're, when you're, uh, when you, when you're managing these projects, you know, you look at the, the Army Corps permit and, and uh, the Fish and Wildlife, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, if you have salmon and, you know, uh, steelhead trout, you, you want to look at the National Marine uh, Fishery Service permits as well. So all those are really, really important because it'll give you different work windows. Um, it'll give you exceedance, certain turbidity exceedance, maximum exceedance levels. So all that's really, really important. So the types of uh, diversions that you do, you want to, you know, if you got to build a bridge, you, you have to, uh, you have to be able to divert the water somehow. So different ones you can use are K-rail diversions, um, kind of narrowing that, temporarily narrowing the the, the uh, width of the uh, stream at the work zone. You can, uh, the, the, the piped creek diversion, and then we're going to go through the in-water work, the trestle, you know, that you build over. So coffer dam, clear water, all this stuff is when you're going to need to do water type testing um, in, uh, you know, on different projects. So I don't know if this, so this is just the pre-construction. You could see that amazing uh, video. This is, or I'm sorry, this photo, uh, kind of low quality here. But you have the width here. You, we have to um, have to narrow this in order to, to have an approach for your abutments and you know, putting in different uh, structures, these pier walls, for instance. Um, you know, they're going to go in the water. So they got to put coffer dams up, dewater those areas to build, it, to actually build the structure, <clears throat> which means pile driving. A lot of work, vibration, a lot of impact. This area has steelhead trout, salmon, red-legged frogs, all sorts of stuff for at this site um, in uh, Browns Valley. This site's in Browns Valley. So uh, video does not exist, so that's always uh, happy. That's always great. So we'll just go over the photo play-by-play. -play. Um, so, you know, putting in these K-rails, we're, uh, <clears throat> we're here uh, making sure that uh, fish are being um, kind of moved out in the areas using seine nets and things like that, just to ensure that um, nothing is getting uh, is uh, injured or killed or anything like that. Um, you've got to have your biologist there, and then of course you got to be testing the water um, upstream and downstream to see what is the level of impact uh, in terms of turbidity or something like this. pH probably not much of an issue because that's just a solid piece of concrete. Shouldn't be leaching anything, changing. The pH of water. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so this is a different type of uh, diversion here. Of course, I would have uh, played a video, but it doesn't exist thanks to my um, astute uh, technology abilities. Um, I apologize for that. Just um, use your imagination and creativity of uh, there actually a crane putting in a K rail. So, I apologize. So, this is the final. Product, you see how this is really narrowed. They put in gravel. This gravel was actually native to the Yuba River, which is uh, which is is what this this uh, dry creek is. Uh, it contributes to that river. So uh, using the native uh, the native uh, substrate like this rock means you're going to have pretty much similar water chemistry and things like that. You're not adding anything new into the system. Um, you, now they have a better, a much closer approach. They could put a trestle bridge over this to drive vehicles and equipment and build their bridge. While we still have an area where uh, wildlife can safely still move through, uh, you know, they're not working on the weekends or after four o'clock and things like that. So wildlife can still move through that area. Um, and um, also it would, it, would, it would prevent flooding as well to keep it going. So that's one way of, of having a diversion. And then a piped. Piped diversion here in, in Galt. Um, 
and Lagoon Creek. I need to move a little quicker here. Um, so this is just mainly just kind of um, for smaller places, you just put a pipe diversion and you put, uh, uh, you know, gravel over it, make sure that it's nice and secure and make sure that water still flows through, you know, because you want to make sure that you're not flooding. Okay, all these great videos, again, they did not work. So uh, just imagine they're putting a pipe in. Uh, my apologies there. And then um, we're gonna go through uh, the trestle construction. These are different methods of in-water work where you need to do water quality testing. So then doing the tile driving here, then they're actually gonna build a, a, a trestle uh, uh, kind of access point so equipment can move farther out. And then of course you have your turbidity curtain here to ensure that at least you can minimize that that uh, plume of turbidity on the, uh, actually it was the curtain that went all the way to the ground to kind of isolate that turbidity. So then you have this trestle out here. So now you have access to this barge that can uh, do the work. I, uh, I'm gonna move a little bit quicker here just because of time. So water sampling, different types of water sampling you can do. When you have a bigger area, you know, you get a, Baylor system, which is essentially getting a cup out there, taking these water samples, and then uh, measuring for different um, tests, turbidity, pH, and dissolved oxygen, what we call DO. So turbidity is how cloudiness the water is, or turbid, chocolate. Chocolate milk is a common thing that people say, or really clear, you know, and everything in between. pH is a measure of, um, of different ions in, uh, in, in a liquid, so you have acidity, which becomes really low, or basic, which becomes really high in pH. So you want it around seven, a little bit higher than seven, something like that, depending on the, uh, the site. Another way you can actually uh, do it is, is, is be an overhead casting fisher person um, and throw that, throw that vial out there to try and get, um, the, you know, for the, um, to get the upstream and downstream samples so you're, you're ensuring that you're getting a, a clean sample for, uh, for a comparison to the in-water work. So uh, fishermen can use that. Uh, sorry, guys. I, okay. So watercraft sampling, of course, you can use a raft to go out there. If you have access to that, and um, you, know, you can carry it, make it all the way out, and you can get in the middle to get another good sample out in the middle. So I kind of went over this a little bit. What is turbidity? Uh, clarity of liquid. Um, it's important high concentrations um, of that uh, particular matter affect light penetration. It changes ecological productivity, actually can increase um, coliform bacteria to grow. UV light kills col coliform bacteria, which is kind of from um, defecation, poop, things like that, animal, animal poop and stuff. So UV light kills that. If it's turbid and things like that, it does not even get, can, it can create a nasty water. So also creates um, a, a depletion of oxygen in some cases, which would affect uh, fish and other aquatic wildlife. So quite a, uh, it's important to make sure that we're measuring it. Um, so here's the uh, turbidity using infrared. I'm just kind of moving here. This pH meter, you know, these are the different uh, sampling kits. Another sampling kit. I'm just trying to, I'm running out of time, unfortunately. Um, DO. Uh, DO is very important because, like I had mentioned, like um, the higher the DO, uh, the better, um, you know, aquatic life can breathe. Like fish, salmon, especially, very important. If you're a if you're a turtle, you you got lungs, you really don't care too much about dissolved oxygen. Um, but fish fish really do. It's really important, and you can actually see fish kills if the water gets too low, uh, or I'm sorry, the dissolved oxygen gets too low. So if you have high di uh, turbidity um, can lower dissolved oxygen, which could create a fish kill. Fish kill creates bacteria. Um, that that death creates bacteria to grow. Flies land on it, and now you can start getting a botulism outbreak. So it actually would, then could spread to uh, the human population. So all this is really important, and it does affect uh, society quite a bit. So um, you know, just can I just. Uh, these are just other factors that can prevent turbidity. Um, agricultural runoff, you know, um, can, can affect uh, water quality, of course. Um, that's coming off of uh, pesticides and, and, and uh, nutrient, high nutrient loads. Of course, human impact, you know, boating and things like that. If we have gas leaks, 
And of course, wildflower fires. Last year, we were able to actually see the impact of all those massive fires up in the Northern California and Central Valley. Um, that ash was actually affecting the water quality, uh, the pH level. We were seeing changes. So be safe out there. Have fun. I kind of kind of crammed at the end there, but there's five minutes to spare. If there's any questions, you know. Or wait, but this was supposed to go to four thirty, wasn't it? I was like rushing here to um, four o'clock. I apologize. So I could go a little slower. If you have questions, I can go back to this, um, to everything. So uh, Rebecca, you can, uh, I didn't realize I could go till 4.30. I apologize, it's kind of pushing through. Yeah, if you have anything that you wanna go over again, feel free to. And it looks like there's a question that just came in if you wanna answer yeah. that. Is there, ever, uh, is there ever a situation where reclaim water um, would prove not to be beneficial for ecological environmental restoration? Um, that's a really good question. Um, it does depend. Um, you could get um, salinity fluctuations in reclaimed water, and you don't know um, what those fluctuations are from the source. It kind of varies. So um, it depends if the water, if those water, uh, if, if the uh, plants are, are, are very sensitive to salinity changes or something that could be quite the, uh, quite the effort. Uh, it could affect your plants. It could affect the soil chemistry. And of course, if, if there's any sensitive amphibians around, you know, they're very, very salt intolerant. So almost like lactose intolerance, but salt intolerant. Now, they, they, now it's even worse. So, um, can you please talk more about the wetland project you did at San Diego? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I could just talk to, I'll talk as I go through this here. So yeah, so um, that, that's a, that was a mitigation site that had kind of two layers of mitigation with the Army Corps of Engineers, the Orange County Flood Control District, um, and then also the Orange County Transportation Authority had to do some mitigation as well. So um, um, what we did is, is um, you know, they had, they had different requirements in terms of habitat mitigation and wetlands and and all of that. So uh, designing that, the way that that works is we actively pump up the water from the channel. It also has a, a pipe to reclaimed water as well um, to make sure that the ponds keep flowing in case you know there's some sort of issue. And um, each pond is actually where the where the water comes into the ponds. Um, I'm trying to get there. Where they get into the ponds, they um, it's gravity fed. So each pond that cascades, um, so right here we have pond A, then it goes to pond B, pond C, pond D, pond E, and kind of into pond F, and there's a little outflow here and it terminates. So it doesn't leave the system, it actually infiltrates into the ground. Um, this is Santa Ana River floodplain soil right here, very sandy, infiltrates into the ground, and then you have all this habitat. So, um, and then at each spot right here, um, this right where, where the water inflows into these ponds, we have emerging vegetation growing where we have um, bulrush and cattails growing at these sites. Um, and so the water flows into these sites. The, um, the bulrush actually and cattails, they are highly, highly effective at growing very really quickly in the summertime, especially and they take up a lot of nitrogen for their proteins and phosphorus and all sorts of things. There's even evidence that they, that the bacteria on the plants have symbiotic relations to, to fix heavy metals, to digest that kind of stuff as well, um, and turn it into um, uh, kind of inert forms in anoxic environments. So it's kind of um, getting rid of that, getting, getting rid of some of those toxins, there's, there's a tons of um, Pacific tree frogs here. Um, there's fish, there's turtles. We didn't put any of that stuff in. They're just, they just came in. This was just a field. And, um, and that water goes into the groundwater. So it's actually feeding into the aquifer. So that water could have been going to the coastline, which creates red tides and botulism and things like that. Public health issues, closing the beaches, econ economic issues. Um, instead, building something like this um, creates, there's trails, creates a, a, a space for people to walk, clean air, lower stress. Um, there's Lee Spells Virio, which is endangered. 
Um, this is the only population of white-faced ibis in Orange County that nests. Um, and these started coming in as about 50 or 60 pairs here. Um, uh, California gnat catcher, another endangered bird occurs here. So uh, really, really, uh, it's a really, uh, really cool uh, uh, project. I, I wish I could build a, maybe a hundred thousand of them and maybe that would help the wetland issue uh, in the state of California. I'd be more than happy to do that. <laughs> um, and if, so if there are any other questions on that, you definitely, you know, put it in the, the uh, chat here. Um, the Baylor method, the next question is, is the Baylor method used both for lotic and lentic systems? Uh, that's a good question. So for what we've used it, it was only a, we only use it for um, the lotic moving systems. Um, and that was because we had trouble getting access to uh, to the boats. So we were working with um, Grossimer and Wall, a big contractor um, in, the, in the valley in, in uh, Dutra. And due to COVID, we weren't allowed on their on their barge to take samples. And we didn't have a we didn't have a watercraft. It was somewhere else at the at the time. So we came up with using the uh, <laughs> a fishing rod to get gather to, to do a sample grab essentially, and it worked. And um, you know, as long as we got in the middle of that stream, that water sample without, you know, mucking around out there and creating any type of turbidity, um, you know, you're getting a good water quality sample. So in terms of a lentic system, um, I'm just trying to, to think about um, how that would work. I think it does, uh, I think it would work. Um, you just have to make sure that you're getting it from, you know, an area that uh, that has good depth and kind of a great, a good sample that would, uh, that would showcase kind of the, what you think the natural baseline turbidity is of the, of the site, of whatever you're doing. So if it's a reservoir or something like that, I'm sure that'd be fine. And actually with reservoirs, it might even be, when you don't have a boat, that could be a, a really viable option to grab a water sample because some of those areas are very steep or inaccessible um, to walking or unsafe. So uh, yeah, good question. <clears throat> are there any other questions that you guys have? It looks like I guess I can go through the whole thing again because I rushed through it if you, <laughs> if you want me to. <laughs> Is there anything you specifically want to call out, Barry? that you'd like to spend more time on or if you um, want to end early that's also okay no you know it's i i, I don't want to i don't need to end early unless if people start peeling off here um you know the goal the goal of uh, and uh, purpose of giving this talk like i said in the beginning if people missed it was to really showcase like you know all the resources that we have and how do you protect them you know um, I think sometimes we get caught up in like reading the permits and these are the things, all the things we must do to make sure we're in compliance and all that, which of course we have to do. And that's very important, making sure that you're reporting everything, whether it's a normal, normal water sample or an exceedance, which is a different report or annual reports or monthly reports, whatever, whatever is written in the permit or, or required for the project. Um, but, but but kind of, I wanted to kind of focus on the foundation of why there have these exceedances and, you know, why, why it's important to not hit those exceedances too often. What can happen um, to the system, uh, the, the water, the, the uh, ecosystem that we're working in, uh, you know, over time. So um, water is such a crucial, crucial, crucial uh, resource for this planet and especially the state we're in the arid west and you have 40 million people you know and we we need to, we need to drink what is it like eight eight ounces glasses a day or something like that you know times 40 million of course that's not the main reason why we have water shortages but uh you know just to think about all the water that's used so in all these different species you know they don't even they're running out of places to live so it's um pretty important to, you know, make sure that 
kind of see the whole picture of why um, water quality is important and why um, we're doing that. Uh, were fountains ever considered for the middle of each pond up here? Um, no, no, they were not. Fairview Park, that's the name of this site is Fairview Park. Um, so the question was, were fountains ever considered for the middle of, of each pond of Fairview Park? The answer is no. I guess also the, um, the challenges, you know, because it's like, you know, I talked about all the great things with about a site like this when you create wetlands, um, is uh, nature wants to keep growing once you put it in and, and uh, you know, all these kind of emergent plants right here, cattails, Typhalatifolia or Typha um, they can spread and get really thick and then create mosquito issues, which is a public, could be public health issue. Um, we, we run into that at this place where we do, I still, our team still does the management of this, of these wetlands in the park. And, um, and it can create a lot of algae issues. Um, so if, if anybody's ever wanting to design stuff like that, definitely have to consider kind of the long-term maintenance um, efforts and costs um, for a site like this and consider um, flow for mosquitoes and our algae growth and mosquitoes and invasive species and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, and of course, even with, uh, you know, after a construction project, when you've done all that work, you know, that has to be considered the equipment might have brought in a weed or, you know, I know there's a lot of invasive um, species uh, prevention plans and stuff, but uh, even if we do the best we can, you know, if everybody just walks away and there's still, what if there is still an invasive plant that gets in there and starts uh, wreaking havoc? So I think um, also post post studies would be important too and how long-term effects are. So, um, so the next one, how do you manage for mosquitoes and algae? Um, it's a good question. So. Um, so for algae, it's, it's literally, we don't use any chemicals or anything. We just use mechanical methods of rakes and, and kind of skimming devices that my team has uh, invented and, you know, customized for this site. So it's just kind of like, um, you know, on a, especially in the summer, uh, you know, keeping an eye on to make sure that that, that algae is um, removed. The reason why, um, not only is it, it doesn't look good, it can affect water quality, the Anopheles mosquito, that's a genus that carries malaria, um, breeds in the algae mats, the stagnant water in the summer in the algae mats. So because of public health issue, they do carry West Nile. So that eliminates that species. Um, making sure that the cattails are thinned is another in the, in the um, bulrush are all thinned outside of the nesting bird season since there's a lot of, um, we created a lot of uh, biological resources here. Um, you know, we got to make sure that we still manage for them. So thinning these, cutting them, trimming them down um, to make sure that water flows. So mosquito larvae, um, they actually don't, they, they are born, the eggs are laid in the water, but they still need to breathe on, on the surface. So any type of water disturbance that breaks that water tension, um, they can't breathe anymore. So they kind of suffocate. So that, so you see all these ripples right here and the wind moving out here. Mosquitoes can't live here. Too much water surface uh, tension movement. But they'll, if, if this is a thick patch of cattails, then they can live in there and, um, and breed. So kind of just removing their habitat and minimizing it. So it's, it, it's quite an effort in some cases, if it's, if, especially if it's not managed on a time, in a timely manner, um, because cattails and, Wetland plants in something in California, they grow very, very fast and are almost as productive in terms of carbon sequestration as tropical rainforest. So they they grow very, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> uh, the next question, how long are these ponds designed to last for? Do they have 50 to 300 year design warranty? Uh, mostly, I'm curious how sedimentation is taken into account to prevent flooding of areas outside the designated wetland. Uh, that's a good question. In terms of flooding, um, this is outside of the uh, flood control channel of the Santa Ana River flood control channel. 
and we could just turn the pumps off and because you need active pumping to get into these wetlands. Um, in terms of the warranty, um, these ponds in terms of design, I don't know how long they're designed for. Um, I did most of the, um, the ecological components of it and um, uh, the hydrologist did the more of the um, the designing of the of the shape and everything like that. Um, and three hundred years, I I mean that would be that would be tough, especially when you ask the question about sedimentation because um it so these were built in two thousand nine. I think they started getting filled with water two thousand twelve, and I I I believe that there's already I'm starting to see at least in the um, the large pond at the end, um, uh, some sedimentation. So that it, uh, this pond right here is already starting to get shallower and shallower. And I think most pond, it's, it's quite well known that they do fill up with sediment. And so there needs to be, um, you know, maintenance in terms of dredging and digging those out. Um, <clears throat> there is a channel here that's also a flood control channel that the Orange County flood, flood control uh, manages. And um, this has, when they were building this, this actually has flooded into this site. So um, good question. So this actually isn't connected to any, any uh, actual river where it would be flowing or any, any loading system that would flow, this could flow out. So it's kind of a closed system. Um, yeah, are there any other questions to that, um, to this wetland or, or any, any of the species that I went over, any of the in-water work methodologies? Um, you know, of course, I didn't mention as I was kind of busting through is you need to, is all the reporting you need to do for each day that you're sampling, uh, collecting that data, that data. I know for Caltrans projects, for instance, you know, I mean, those type eight reports for daily, um, daily monitoring type seven, if there's an exceedance and then, uh, type one for monthly, it's a monthly report. Those are, those are the big ones. And then of course you have the annual report, which I think is a type two, I uh, can't recall, but uh, uh, several different reporting that needs to go on to ensure that, um, you know, the, the water quality is staying within, um, you know, a decent range and, and lower than the exceedance. And if it is exceeded, does reach an exceedance, I mean, stuff happens uh, out of the control of a project, like, especially if you're working in a system where there's a farm field upstream, they just release all their water, it could create, it could create a, a turbidity issue. So um, that's kind of when you gotta make sure that those reporting, the reporting is explained correctly, um, where it's like, hey, there is turbidity as we are finding, but it could be from other factors that are outside of the actual project um, limits. And then you, you have to prove that by taking upstream and downstream samples that would, um, that would also uh, uh, kind of prove that the exceedance is outside of the actual uh, limits of your project. So if there's anybody in the water board that wants to correct me, <laughs> that's fine too. Uh, that's that's at least my my understanding of it, or 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 want to add anything to it as well. Um, but I think that's that's actually it um, for the, for my presentation. But I'm happy to continue answering any questions um, about this, about anything that we talked about the you know sampling the diversions. Um, how this affects projects, how it affects wildlife, um, wetlands, storing wetlands, anything like that. Perfect. Well, thank you, Barry, so much. This was very helpful and very interesting and um, great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for your questions and for participating. And if you missed any part of this or want to see it, it will be recorded and on our website, probably within about 24 hours. So you can catch it there.